Hi everyone, um, thanks for uh, attending today. So this is the, uh, the third in the um, series of uh, thought leadership talks um, based on the work we're doing in the NGCDI project. Uh, I'm Arjun Parikh from BT Research. Um, I run a team called Self Learning Networks. Um, <clears throat> and just uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to remind you that um, there are some future talks planned for uh, the new year. Um, so we have uh, Network Assurance through Massive Online Anomaly Detection uh, on the 13th of January, Intelligent Asset Management for Service Assurance and Infrastructure Management uh, on the 10th of February, and Network Resource Optimization and Ambitious Deep Learning on the 9th of March. Um, so all those again uh, from, from 1 till 2. Uh, the details are on the NGCDI website, so that's ng-cdi.org, uh, for anyone external, um, or the details are available um, on Workplace, I think, um, and possibly on the Applied Research website for those within BT. So for today's talk, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Ajit Palikad. Um, Ajit is a reader in Asset Management at the Department of Engineering in the University of Cambridge. Ajit leads a research group focused on exploiting data and digital technologies to improve the maintenance and operation of industrial and infrastructure systems. He's the Scientific Secretary of the IFAC Working Group on Advanced Maintenance Services and Technology and sits on the steering board of the UK Digital Twin Hub. Ajit leads the Cambridge activities within the NGCDI project. Thanks a lot, Arjun. Um, um, so um, welcome everyone, and thanks a lot, first of all, for inviting me to give this talk um, to all of you. Um, hopefully I'll uh, be um, um, entertaining to all of you for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, so uh, this, this talk, as um, uh, Arjun said, this is going to be on intelligent asset management. Um, so a, a rough overview of the talk itself, uh, it's split into three parts. Um, first off, I'll uh, provide you with some introduction to the, the, the idea behind asset management and then move on to this concept of asset intelligence. What is asset intelligence? Um, what is an intelligent asset? Uh, in other words, what is um, um, digital twins? And then in the third part, uh, I will move on to uh, some um, uh, some of the some of the ideas and concepts that we are pushing uh, through NGCDI, pushing the boundaries of the, this idea of intelligent assets. And in within each of the parts, I will first introduce the concept and then highlight a few of the the, the research activities that we are uh, um, carrying out as part of NGCDI and and beyond that within our research group. So you get a flavor of um, what kind of work we do and uh, also uh, a, a hopefully a, a better understanding of what these concepts actually mean. Um, to start off, um, um, asset management, um, as I said, and the origins of asset management really uh, comes from uh, maintenance, uh, the, the field of maintenance. And uh, this, this slide really shows the, the journey that organizations um, have taken over the last um, uh, few decades in, um, in, in, in changing the way, way maintenance is looked at and maintenance is carried out in, in organizations. So um, in, in old times, uh, well, I, I keep saying old times and new times, but I'll, I'll quickly um, also clarify later on what I really mean by that. So maintenance really started off by um, um, really uh, thinking about our equipment and um, fixing the equipment uh, when they fail. So that's that's how it all start, started off. So it's, it was predominantly just a repair activity um, rather than um, the a, a maintenance activity as we know today. But then quickly um, we, we realized that uh, fixing things when they fail is not quite the most effective option to take uh, for all kind of equipment because when things fail um, in an unplanned manner, the, the, the unplanned costs, um, the failure costs and the unplanned downtime was far too expensive compared to if we can take certain action before the failure actually happens. So if we are able to understand the behavior of our equipment and, and kind of try and see whether we can have a scheduled maintenance activity, what we call preventive maintenance activity, fixing things before they fail, 
the planned downtime and the planned failure costs or planned costs of maintenance was found to be far lower than the, the unplanned costs um, that we incur when things fail um, without any, any warning. So increasing number of assets today are um, maintained uh, based on a fixed interval, um, uh, based on a fixed time interval or a fixed usage interval. Um, we then, um, with the advent of uh, advanced um, computing technologies and data analysis technologies and, and other um, technologies for, for sensing um, the, the condition of our equipment, we moved from our scheduled maintenance kind of an approach to more um, uh, on a condition-based maintenance approach. Now, the problem with scheduled maintenance is that once we decide that a particular class of equipment is going to be maintained or inspected every six months, for example, you apply that regardless of whether the maintenance is actually required or not. Um, so there might be, we, we might have been doing a bit of over maintenance on some assets of that class and some under maintenance on some of the other assets in the class. But a condition monitoring and condition-based maintenance allows you to monitor the actual um, condition and the behavior of that equipment. And based on the signals that we get from these sensors, condition monitoring sensors, we are then able to take necessary action when required. So that, but that's that's the what I call it the third generation uh, maintenance. And now with what we are seeing increasingly is um, with the with the uh, um, emergence of new data analytics techniques, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on, what we can see is that we can not only um, monitor the condition of our equipment and understand their behavior, but by learning from past experiences, we are able to predict what might happen in the future with, the, with these uh, equipment. And hence, we can move from a condition-based maintenance, which is more or less, I, I would say, a reactive kind of a maintenance. Instead of reacting to a failure, you are actually reacting to a condition signal, a sensor signal. Moving from there to using these signals and this data to predict when a failure is going to happen towards, again, a planned um, maintenance activity, but then as opposed to the scheduled planned maintenance, here we are actually doing a condition-based planned maintenance, which, is, which we call predictive uh, maintenance. Now, over the last few years, another um, um, field of thought that has emerged is that uh, maintenance as an activity should not be carried out in isolation. Maintenance as an activity should be, cons should be carried out in consideration to the whole life of that equipment, in consideration to other aspects that are pertinent to the organization and the organizational goals and objectives. And this um, comes under, so this, this was coined under the, under, under the term asset management. So here we are actually looking at the management of assets rather than simply the maintenance of assets. So, it, so in, in this, what I call this fourth generation of, uh, of maintenance, we talk about asset management, we talk about whole life costing or life cycle costing, and as I said, uh, predictive maintenance and so on. So that's, that's roughly the journey that we have been through over the last few decades in terms of the understanding of this, this whole area of uh, maintenance and operation of equipment. Now, that is not to say that today, most of the organizations or all the leading organizations are in the fourth generation and we are all doing predictive maintenance uh, and nothing else is happening. That is not true. There is still a, a wide range of activities that happen under asset management that, that, um, that includes the fix when it fails reactive maintenance approach as well. And there's nothing wrong in reactive maintenance. So don't get me wrong on that. Um, in, for certain types of equipment, reactive maintenance might be the right strategy to, to use. So so um, although I've put this in a, in a timeline, it doesn't mean that everything now revolves around uh, predictive maintenance. So that's a, a, just an overview of um, <clears throat> how we got here from, from where we were uh, over the last few decades. So just looking at asset management and trying to understand what it actually means, um, asset management really demands that, that holistic perspective. And it is about and, and the, the, the ISO standard on asset management, the ISO 55,000, um, which was published, if I remember correctly, in 2014. It really uh, highlights that asset management is 
less about the management of assets. It's more about the management of value. So it's about understanding how the collection of assets that you have in your system, in your network, holistically provides value to the organization. And it's about asset management is a range of activities that you do on your assets in order to manage value. So we are actually managing value by carrying out interventions in your assets. So value becomes a, an interesting and a, a, a important concept in, in asset management. So what does value actually mean? So if you look at the first picture in this slide, uh, it's really a combination of three different things. Um, it's, uh, it's a combination of the cost uh, that you, you incur uh, in intervening in your in your assets in, in the different interventions that you take. Now, interventions could range from repair to maintenance to replacement, um, overhaul, uh, complete renewal, uh, and so on. Um, so there's a cost of doing that. And on the other hand, what you have is the risk that is arising from your assets as well. So the, when the assets fails, fail, it, pro, uh, it, it produces a risk um, uh, towards your, your ability to, to, to provide service in, in, a, in a telecommunications network, for example. So there's a, there's a risk from the asset and it, it's not just service risk, it is also safety related risks and other uh, risks um, um, come into picture as well. So there's cost, there's risk, and there's the performance of the assets themselves. So it's about the managing management of the, these three aspects that actually provides you with, with value. So how much money do you spend um, in order to minimize the risk and maximize the performance is the question. Now, when you think about value from that point of view, what we quickly realize is that although in terms of our interventions, in terms of our cost, you might be intervening on individual pieces of equipment. So you might be intervening on a base station. You might be intervening on a router. The value that you get is not necessarily just individually tied to an equipment. The value that you get is tied to the system as a whole, the network as a whole. It's the network that provides BT with value. It's the network that provides your customers the service that they need and not just individual, an individual router. So when, when it comes to making decisions about maintenance, you need to, whether, whether it is the timing of the maintenance or prioritization of maintenance, you need to have that network perspective and the system perspective. To, to be, you need to be able to extrapolate the failures or the things that are happening to individual equipment to what how the system behaves in order to be able to drive your decisions effectively. The third idea that again uh, comes from value is that value is often delivered, um, not all, often, it's always delivered over the life of the equipment. So what actions you take now will have an impact over the life of that equipment, over the life of the system. So if you do something to save some money today, you might end up with a higher risk over the life of that equipment and might end up spending a lot more later on. So you need to have that holistic whole life approach to, to making decisions. And finally, asset management really strongly um, says that uh, we need to break the silos within the organization and for any activity that you carry out in, in your, in your um, assets and your, and your system, there need to be a very strong line of sight, very clear line of sight to the organizational objectives and goals. So anything that you do, whether it is renewals on your, on your network, whether it is maintenance on your network, you need to be able to tie that with the organizational objectives. And when, when I say the organizational objectives, often what we find is when we try to make this relationship to the, to the organizational goals, you get this, um, 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 you, you, you get a feel that it's, it's not a single objective or there is no single stakeholder that that provides these goals and objectives that you, you often have to take a multi-stakeholder approach when you when you um, when you when you're taking actions um, in um, in asset management so that strategic um, perspective also enforces a multi-stakeholder perspective as well in, in in the management of value so hopefully that the, the, those four elements um, provide a clear picture of what what asset management actually means now I'll take you through a couple of examples that arises from our research that kind of highlights what, what these concepts actually mean. Um, so um, the, the first example is a, is a piece of work that we did with um, um, Exxon uh, in one of their petrochemical refineries. Um, so this year we were talk, uh, looking at the maintenance of uh, their uh, desalination uh, tanks and vessels in, in one of the water treatment areas. Now, 
what um, the company was um, doing at, 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 the, at the time was that they, they have a very clear risk management approach to, to uh, managing the, uh, the refinery, of course, the critical um, uh, system. They have to be very mindful of risk. Um, but what they had done was to, to look at individual assets in isolation and looked at for what, how, what level of risk does individual assets um, actually give rise to. So in this case, they had within that uh, desalination plan, they had a fleet of seven vessels that had to jo pull that, that jointly delivered the, the water treatment facilities that are required for the, for the plant. And when you look at the demand and the, the capacity of the system, what um, you find is that at any point of time, any point in time, only five out of those seven vessels are required to meet the capacity, which meant that they had a bit of redundancy in the system, which also means that in their criticality calculation, the criticality of these equipment was quite low. Which, so so what, what, what they ended up doing is, was to um, uh, develop a, a, an optimized maintenance and renewal plan that was optimized for individual vessels, um, um, so vessels individually. But when we came up uh, and looked at this problem, what we, what we actually saw was that um, although the, um, um, the, the only five out of the seven vessels were required at any point in time, um, because these seven vessels were deteriorating rapidly, um, well, uh, here you can see straight lines, but of course in our model we did uh, include some uncertainties and the, the, the lines were more squigglier than, than straight. What it um, uh, produces is a very high level of risk towards the end of life of these seven vessels, because any of these seven vessels or multiple of these seven vessels could fail at the same time towards that 20, 20 to 25 year time, time period. So on, on, the, on the right hand side, you can see the, the risk profile towards that later stage of the life cycle of these equipment were really, really high. Now, when we developed, so what we did then did was we developed a, a mathematical model, an optimization model that actually looked at this, 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 uh, these vessels at not as, a, as individual pieces of equipment, but as a fleet of assets that together provided a level of service that, were, that was required by the uh, desalination plant. And when we take that approach, what we find is that you don't actually maintain the vessels or replace the vessels when, when they come to their end of life at the, at the 20, 25 year uh, time frame, but you have to do regular maintenance activities, regular inspection and maintenance activities uh, throughout their lifetime. And by doing a regular maintenance and uh, renewals activity throughout the lifetime, you actually end up with a much lower risk profile, and which is also much more contained within a, a five-year time frame as well. So the overall risk of the system was reduced and their ability to provide that service. So in this case, it's the water, water purification service was enhanced as well by, by taking a fleet-wide approach instead of an equipment, um, individual equipment approach. Um, the next example is uh, the work that we are currently doing with Rolls-Royce, which is looking at uh, how, uh, what kind of service uh, strategy they can apply to uh, their um, uh, aircraft engines. So here again, what we looked at was the, the nature of the failures of the different types, uh, different engines that they have uh, under operation. Um, and one of the things that we, um, uh, the, the engineers also knew and we realized by looking at the data was that the, the, the failure rates really Really dependent on uh, mainly two factors. One is the number of uh, takeoff and landing cycles and the number of operational hours as well. So what, what they normally have in place is um, so similar to what um, we do with our cars, for example, they have a maintenance program that, uh, that says you, you have to do a maintenance uh, when um, at the least of the number of hours or the number of cycles is X thousand and so on. So that's, that's, that's what they, they used to do. But then when what we could do with the, by looking at the entire fleet holistically is that we could first of all cluster the, the engines in certain categories. So that's, that's what you see on the right-hand side of the, um, um, of, of, of the graph. We could cluster the engines in terms of their behavior um, in, 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 a, in a number of categories, but more importantly, what we could see is that by taking operational decisions and operational actions, so for example, if you see that a particular engine, so here, um, 
can't see my uh, mouse, um, but the, on, on the dark blue cluster, you can see that there are a number of points that are uh, slightly away from the cluster uh, towards the left hand side. So, which means that the, those, those engines, they are not flying for long hours, but they have um, a larger number of uh, la landing and take takeoff um, cycles, which means that they are really flying very, very short haul um, flights. Now, if, if, if Rolls-Royce can work with the airlines customers and can convey this message and can change the schedule of these flights or put these flights on a different sector where their, their landing and takeoff cycles are managed more carefully. And what, what it means is that we can actually get more flying time from these flights than what would what, what they would normally um, um, would have uh, had if they continued to to use these these flights in in the original uh, manner. So we could offer a kind of more customized um, service provision based on what the aircraft was actually doing at, at, at the time by by understanding the behavior more more better. So again, that 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 holistic approach really helps in this um, uh, in these kind of situations. Um, now, when it comes, the, the, the other aspect that I mentioned was also that uh, when we are managing large fleets of assets, uh, complex systems and complex networks of assets, we need to understand and manage the needs of different stakeholders, um, and we need to manage the, the system more effectively rather than uh, the, the individual assets. So an example here is the work that we uh, are, are doing and have done with um, uh, people like Highways England and the local councils who are managing a number of bridges across their road network. So here what we found was, um, so we, we did a three-stage approach for, for developing a maintenance plan for a, for a fleet of uh, bridges or a network of bridges. We started off with looking at individual bridges and developing an optimal maintenance, um, predictive maintenance plan based on the, in their inspections and so on for the different defects in each of these bridges. And then in the next step, what we said was, there is actually an opportunity. Uh, first of all, um, these different defects are managed or the repair of these different defects are managed by different departments and different disciplines within uh, the, the bridge team. Now, there might be conflicts um, and resource capacity issues between these teams, but also on the other hand, when, when we look at another key stakeholder in this whole network, which are the customers, the users, me and you who are actually traveling up and down, down the road, um, there's, a, there's a benefit in either merging some of these activities for the user's benefit or, or splitting some of these activities because of resource constraints between the different teams. That means that the, the optimal, the actual optimal time to take the individual actions for individual defects in these bridges might not be optimal when you think about it from a system performance or a network performance point of view. So the optimization model then looks at how we can actually move these individually optimized activities together, either bunch them together, bundle them together to form one group of uh, um, um, work package, or to split some of these work to, 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 to make it two different work packages um, that that brings in that kind of brings in the optimality question for for the different teams within um, the the department or um, the the multi stakeholder approach the the different users uh, needs as well. So so what you think is optimal for the individual defect might not be optimal for a bridge. And then of course when we consider the network wide performance, then there's a third stage optimality question there that, that we ask. Okay, we have now found optimal work packages for each of these these bridges. Now when you look at the network performance, can we actually combine some of these activities? So uh, instead of if you are closing down one bridge on a route, you might as well actually do um, activities on two bridges on the same route because that route is anyway closed for for customers. So instead of shutting down the, uh, a, a, another bridge on the same route on another day, which again, if, uh, uh, by default, it closes down that route for the customers, you can actually combine those two activities. So first level activities optimization for the defects, second level activities optimization based on the bridge, and the third level activities optimization based on the, the network performance. And what we find is that that delivers a much lower over, overall lifecycle cost and so better customers as a whole. And then extrapolating that to a, an extreme situation where, so this is this is, this is is a work that we are doing with Network Rail, and this, this very much correlates with what BT experiences as well. Um, 
Now, Network Rail has got different teams that are responsible for maintaining their tracks, their signaling systems, their telecoms, their structures, and so on. Now, at the at the at the start of the year, all of these teams will do their own run their own optimization models and develop their own maintenance plans. And they come to the asset manager for Network Rail and say, "We need X million pounds to do our work in an optimal way." Now. The, the asset manager would sit and say, okay, I have one third of the, the sum of all the amounts that these different disciplines are asking me. So how do I actually uh, deploy the, 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 the scarce money, that the investment that I've got across the different disciplines, across the different routes? Now, here what we have is um, not only uh, a, a, again, here, uh, each of these disciplines, each of these disciplines as stakeholders will have their own objectives so one challenge is to bring all these objectives together into a single frame of uh, decision making framework but also then once we put all these different objectives together you all you often find that some of these objectives actually conflict with each other so we have to actually then then look at a multi objective decision making problem which has got innumerable possible optimal solutions when we put all these different optimal solutions from individual disciplines together you have a lot of these optimal solutions which you see that the first cluster of solutions on the on the left hand side that the asset manager has to then deal with so which amongst these 600 possible optimal solutions is the uh, is the answer that i should actually take uh, within my budget remit currently these decisions are based on uh, extensive experience um, um, that they, that these these asset managers have on from from pre previous years but what we have uh, done here is to uh, to de to develop a tool which uh, converts these these 500 different solutions to a, a pruned set of um, optimal solutions that 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 boils down these 500 solutions to to five or six solutions that are representative of these these um, 500 optimal solutions and then the decision maker can actually make a more meaningful trade off between the five or six seemingly optimal solutions and pick one of them that that um, th then then uh, you can bring in political cons uh, constraints managerial constraints preferences and so on to select between the five or six instead of looking at it from um, um, uh, from a from a collection of 600 uh, point of view so it becomes it brings a more systematic approach to making these decisions but what the message that i want to convey is that when when it comes to looking at uh, a system, um, a whole entire system perspective and a multi-stakeholder perspective, decision making can get really, really complex, and we need powerful tools to support these uh, decision making processes. So, moving on to the next set of um, uh, next concept. So that was just an introduction to asset management. Now let's look at what data-driven decision making and, and data can really provide to, to support um, the way in which we, we manage our assets. So what, what does asset intelligence really mean? So this is just, this is an introductory slide to, to convey that, that idea of asset intelligence. So what does it really mean? So if I, if I take an example of a gas turbine, uh, so the, there's a real gas turbine, a physical um, gas turbine, which um, a company like Siemens or GE, they sell to their customers. They are sitting in a, in a, in a, in a refinery or some kind of facility where it is generating power. Yeah. Now, asset intelligence allows you to see what is happening in the, uh, in the real world gas turbine. So in today's world, we call them digital twins. So the, these are um, uh, a, a digital representation of the, the, the physical asset that we have. So what, what can these digital twins actually do? So now, now if these twins, the, the, the physical twin of this, this, uh, this gas turbine, so the actual gas turbine is equipped with sensors, for example, the digital twin or the, this, this, this intelligent asset will let us see what is actually happening on the on the physical asset. So here in this example, you have you might have a number of sensors that that are sending data, so you can visualize those sensors. But also the 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 asset would be sending other information that allows us to understand what state it, is it? Is it on or off? Is the how much power is it generating? How many hours has it been running um, for? And so on and so forth. So you can asset intelligence allow you to see what is happening to your assets. But with all this data that the, the asset is collecting, what asset intelligence allow you to do is to think. Now, 
with the data and along with some logic, if the asset is provided with some, some kind of logic, it, it uses this logic and realizes that no, it, it can, um, uh, this, this asset is actually working in a normal fashion. So there is no abnormality working normally. So it can apply some logic, it can think and tell you some extra information that, um, that, that is based on the data that the asset is producing. Now, over time, if you, if, if, you, if you have a lot of this data, what asset intelligence allow you to do is to learn from his history. So it, either based on the data it is generating, or if the, 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 the digital twin is equipped with some physics-based simulation models and so on, it, it allows you to learn the, the behavior of this, uh, uh, of this equipment. And from this learning, what we can do is to be able to predict what uh, can happen in the future as well. So in the first instance, uh, through this learning, what uh, the, uh, an intelligent asset would be able to do is if there is any deviation in the data patterns that it is generating, it can tell you that, yes, there is an abnormality in the, in the operation of the asset. Um, but so th th that is something that they can do from an anomaly detection point of view, or it can apply predictive analytics, as I said before, to say, okay, it is showing an abnormality now, and it, the, the, the turbine is going to be shut down in a number of hours uh, in, in the future. And hopefully with a certain level of uncertainty involved as well. Um, even with the, 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 the best models, we can't be 100% sure. Now, from this, so all this is good. So being able to see what is happening to the asset, for the asset to be able to think using the data, the asset to be able to learn from its data and, 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 and predict uh, its future. But what asset intelligence should also allow is to act. So in, in moving from just predictive analytics to prescriptive analytics to say, okay, based on what I'm seeing, based on the, the risk um, um, from the asset, based on the cost of um, intervening on the asset, based on the performance that is required um, by the asset, what should be the most effective action to be taken in order to manage the value driven by, generated by the, the gas turbine? So here the action might be to reduce load by 25% so that the life of the equipment can be extended. So the failure will not happen in seven minutes. The failure will be happening sometime later before which we can make a meaningful intervention to the, to the, to the gas turbine. So a asset intelligence allows you to see, think, learn, and act based on um, the, the, the learnings. So some of the work that we are, we are doing within the context of NGCDI um, here, uh, the first example is the work that uh, uh, one of our researchers, Manuel, is doing, looking at the data that is being generated by, or the, uh, the, the, the traffic uh, data that we, uh, that, um, that we see from the BT network. What, uh, what he has done is to apply a novel technique called graph Fourier tran transform. It's, it's a graph signal processing technique, whereby um, the, the signals, the, the traffic patterns from across the network can be analyzed quite efficiently and, and, and very quickly to understand what is normal behavior across the network and what is abnormal behavior. And the key thing what um, uh, he says is that this, this technique is very quick to learn and very quick to detect any, uh, any abnormal behaviors across the network. Now, one of the good things about this technique, this, uh, this uh, graph real transform technique, is that you can also inverse the calculations that you, you, um, you have uh, come up with. So once you identify the anomalies, the, the red lines in these graphs, uh, once you identify the anomalies, you can actually inverse these calculations and actually point to which nodes across this network is actually showing these anomalies. So it can not only detect a network-wide anomaly, it can also diagnose the fault and say, okay, these are the nodes that are behaving um, uh, anomalously um, uh, in, this, in this network. So the, the power of this technique is that it, it can take the entire data from across the network and do this analysis rather than um, doing individual analysis on individual nodes. And again, doing individual analysis on individual nodes will not give a clear picture of the network performance. Uh, a, a node might be behaving anomalously, but uh, it might not mean anything to the network at all. So this, this technique, we believe, um, uh, presents a very powerful tool to, to allow us to use, exploit this data, and understand this network behavior. Now, 
Of course, um, uh, anomaly detection is great, but uh, it's better if we can do predictive analytics. And working with BT, we have uh, looked at two different case studies. One is um, looking at the data that is uh, being generated by the broadband lines uh, to the customers, the wind data, um, and also uh, um, data that is being um, generated by the distribution points as well uh, for, uh, again, um, looking at predicting broadband line failures. Now, one of the things, one of the challenges in this situation and and um, with many other industrial situations is that um, to, in order for effective machine learning algorithms to work um, or machine learning algorithms to work effectively, we need to have a, a large set of data that not only tells us what good behavior means, but also what bad behavior means. And with our industrial equipment, thankfully, they don't fail that often, but that presents a problem to us from a machine learning point of view because we don't have enough anomalous data to learn uh, and and um, learn and predict uh, our failures from. So one of my PhD students, Gishan, has worked very closely with engineers at BT to actually see how can we actually translate the engineering knowledge about the behavior of, of these systems, the, the performance of these systems, and codify them in such a way that we can generate augmented data sets to, to, to improve the, the, the way in which our machine learning algorithms learn and hence can predict our performance. And we can see, we have seen that by generating these augmented data sets that are informed by engineering knowledge, now it's not just random um, uh, augment, um, generation of augmented data sets or duplicating existing data and so on, it's informed by this engineering knowledge. What we have seen is that there is a radical improvement at, at the, of the accuracy of prediction of failures. So that is some, 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 something that we are ongoing as well um, uh, within BT and outside uh, BT as well. Now, so, so that, that allows us to understand what's happening to our equipment. But then the next step, as I said, is it, before we actually take action, we need to really understand what is the impact of these individual anomalies and individual failures on network performance. So again, coming back to Manuel's work, what he has done is uh, develop a simulator that can help um, understand the impact of individual uh, equipment failures or uh, yeah, node failures on the network performance. So this, this simulator, for example, this, these graphs, so this graph here on the left-hand side um, on, on the bottom, that shows the traffic pattern across uh, the, the different nodes in a network over a 24-hour 20, period. And um, this, this video here, what it uh, shows is the criticality of the, the, the nodes across that 24-hour period, the, the size of the nodes um, uh, denote the criticality. So criticality basically means how important is a particular node to the, to the performance of the network. So if that node, a highly critical node fails, that will have a bigger impact on service performance rather than as compared to a, uh, a smaller node or a low criticality node fa failure. And the important thing here is that what we found is that, that the criticality is not really a constant. So you can't really actually just look at it from a static network analysis point of view, look at how many nodes is an individual node connected to. And if the number of nodes that individual nodes are connected to is high, then that node is a critical node. That is a static analysis. But when we look at the traffic patterns and when we look at it, it from a dynamic point of view, what we find is that the criticality of the nodes actually change over time. So nodes that are not critical at one point in time become critical, and nodes that are critical at some point in time uh, become not so critical. And you can see that from this animation as well. There are, of course, a set of nodes that are always critical, that, that, are, that are there in the center, but some other nodes, they keep changing their criticality throughout the time. So when we take actions based on the predictions that we can, um, we can uh, have using our machine learning algorithms, we need to also consider this criticality as well. Now, one of our researchers, Eliona, is, uh, her, her work is going to be putting all of this together to actually see how can we actually develop a network-wide optimal predictive maintenance or a preventive maintenance plan um, that, that, that ju not just considers individual equipment, but considers the network performance as a whole. So extending the work that we have done before, but now from an intelligent asset data-driven point of view. So that's... Um, asset intelligence in a, in a nutshell. But what we are doing now within NGCDI is stretching this idea of asset intelligence further. So what we have seen so far is how we can, asset intelligence allows us to think, see, allows us to think, learn, and act basis based on what we are seeing and learning. Um, what if asset intelligence also means 
the ability of we have, if we can provide assets the ability to communicate with each other, we can provide the assets the ability to cooperate with each other in order to accomplish some goal. So moving from just action oriented to a goal oriented, achieving a, a, a particular goal that is um, 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 common to the entire system. So a system wide goal rather than a, an individualized action for in individual assets. So what does that actually mean when I say extending it from, from see, think, learn, act to communicate, cooperate and achieve? So what we have um, uh, done here in this, um, um, uh, in this respect is to use this concept of um, software agents or agent-based control where there are these software components that are uh, either physically they are present within the assets which can communicate with each other and can make decisions or they can actually sit in the cloud um, and uh, are linked to uh, an asset, but again, can, can, uh, can communicate with each other and can make decisions. So one of the things that we have done is um, apply this, this concept of um, um, uh, intelligent assets that can communicate so through through so that then it becomes a social network of assets right so so these assets can can communicate with each other to apply that to the problem that i mentioned earlier that prognostics or failure prediction is hard because uh, assets often don't have enough data by themselves because they don't fail that often they don't have enough data to learn effectively so here we applied this idea of social networking where these assets through their agents they are able to make friends with other assets that are behaving similar to themselves. So, and once they make friends with assets that are behaving similar to themselves, they can then start sharing their data and experiences between each other. So instead of uh, um, basing their predictions based on their own experiences and their own failures, they can now learn from other assets failures as well. And the idea of making friendship is really important here because we need to make sure that these, these assets don't make friends with random assets. We, these assets make friends with meaningfully similar assets where the learnings can actually enhance the prediction capability rather than confuse the assets even further. So an example of this is shown on the right hand side, the curves here. Uh, um, there, are, there are three machines that are, so here, this, this is an example using ga gas turbines, turbofana engines actually. So there are three machines that are uh, working in diff three different sites. The, the pink line shows the, the sensor data that is being generated by the asset. The uh, black lines, they, uh, that, that is the actual time to failure of, of the asset. And the red line is the predicted time to failure. Now, if, I, if we focus our attention on machine number five or the, the, the asset in the middle, we can see that the sensor data is very similar to, um, the, the pattern of the sensor data is very similar to the pattern of machine two sensor data. Now, which means that these two assets are actually, they have made friends with each other and they, they are sharing their data between each other and they are, they are learning from each other as well. And you can see that the, the predicted time to failure is pretty close and there it's, it's, we are getting a good performance in terms of prediction. Now, all of a sudden through a, towards um, um, the, the middle of uh, the, the graph, you can see that the, the machine five suddenly starts behaving in a different way, yeah? So now it's sensor data doesn't actually sh show the same pattern as it was showing before. But when we compare the sensor data uh, patterns, you can see that now the sensor data is actually showing similar patterns as machine seven and not machine two. Perhaps it is now put in a different operating environment, operating envelope, different load or whatever it is. Now it's behavior is closer to machine seven than machine two. Now, initially the predictions go haywire. Um, it is, the, the machine is not able to predict the failures properly at all, but quickly what it realizes is that um, it should not be actually friends with machine two anymore. It should be friends with machine seven. So this social network platform, which is actually responsible for identifying closely performing assets, it actually tells the asset you should not be, you're actually making friends with the wrong person, uh, um, uh, unfriend machine two and make friends with machine seven. And it does that. And what we can see is once it um, um, starts sharing data between machine seven, it learns very quickly um, within a couple of cycles, it learns its failure patterns quickly and it is able to now predict its failures, even though its pattern has changed, it, it is now able to predict its failures much more effectively. Now, if it was learning from its own data, it will take much longer for it to, be, to, to learn these failure patterns. So that's one thing. And the same thing that we have done 
um, if, if with these social assets and uh, the question we ask is how can assets collaborate with each other to share their workload so that the load put on individual assets is 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 based on how much deterioration it is, uh, how, what the how the condition or the state of health of the the assets are. So you can you can think of this. Um, uh, examples of these would be a, a manufacturing shop floor where there are a number of similar machines producing similar kind of products. There is a demand uh, that is coming to the factory, and collectively these machines should make a number of products on a, on a particular day. Or uh, uh, from a BT point of view, it's your routers. So there's a demand coming from customers. All of these routers, they essentially do the same job, but collectively they should satisfy the demand from, um, from the users. So what these, these intelligent assets here can do is they, these, these agents which are assigned to these assets, they can talk to each other. And if one machine is, is, is in a poor condition, it can actually tell the other machines that I am actually in a poor condition. Can you take some of my workload? And the other machines then take on a higher workload so that this machine doesn't fail abruptly. It can still perform its activities. It, you can extend the lifetime of this, this equipment. And once maintenance is carried out on that machine, then again, that machine can be given a proper workload. Now you can see from this, these graphs here. So the graph above shows the workload allocation between two different machines. Now here in the early days, when the orange machine is at a worse condition than the blue machine, you can see that the blue machine is actually taking more of a workload than the orange one. Now, once the orange one gets maintained, it gets replaced and its condition is much better now compared to the blue machine, you can see that the workload allocation drastically shifts. And this is not something, this is not a decision that is made by a central algorithm. These are decisions that are made by the machines themselves by communicating and collaborating with each other. And I find this, this is really a, 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 an important part of the solution for this next generation um, uh, infrastructure where, where uh, the, the resilience and the robustness of the, of, the, of the network is really, really important. Um, and the last point that I wanted to raise here is that the, the work that we are doing now is um, understanding the practical limitations of the techniques that we have developed where machines are, are, are sharing their data in order to learn from each other, which might not be practical uh, in some cases because of compet competitive reasons or some cases in the BT case, we need to actually uh, the BT network should be designed to carry customers' data rather than carrying its own data. So uh, and anything that we can do to minimize the data traffic for our own solutions is, is a welcome approach. So here, what we are doing is to use uh, techniques such as federated learning and hierarchical modeling to, to allow assets to learn from learn by sharing models uh, or model parameters rather than sharing their ent entire data sets from each other. And what we can see so far from our early research is that these, these techniques do work and they are showing extremely promising results as well. So we, we, can, we can avoid the need to, for assets to share entire data sets uh, in order to um, uh, do this collaborative learning. The last part of this um, presentation I want to quickly touch upon is, um, is um, uh, how is it all enabled? So the key thing about the key enabler for these, these social networking or these, uh, these um, additional asset intelligence is what I said, the software agents. And a, a key part of our research that, that Marco is leading within uh, the research challenge three um, within the NGCDI project, where we are looking at the architectural aspects of uh, the next generation infrastructure, is to look at what, how do we actually design these agents? How do we actually design a standard structure for these agents? And that's what Marco spends most of his time thinking about, is what should be the, the internal architecture of these, these agents and how, how can we effectively deploy these agents in a, in a most effective manner. So he's come up with this idea of containerization, which uh, you all might be familiar with dockers and so on. This concept of containers can be used to, to, um, um, uh, to design, create, and deploy these, these agents in a, in a most effective manner. So a typical internal architecture of this, these containerized agents is what, what I, uh, I've shown you on the left-hand side of the slide. It, it, it has got abilities to observe, which, which can be connected to sensors and data streams and so on. It has the ability to communicate with other agents. It has the ability to make decisions based on some logic or some algorithm. So an algorithm can sit inside that agent. And it has the ability to control um, uh, the, 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 uh, or ac actuate these, these decisions as well. 
and then there is there's an architecture that that he's uh, he's designing which allows um, you to flexibly and scalably create these these agents based on the need to do so so uh, again the, the, we, we need to work together with colleagues and in, in other universities where uh, to to find parallels between this and the virtualization and we actually uh, use uh, those capabilities to actually uh, design, create, and deploy these agents. So, so uh, Marco is coming up with these templates, or he calls it boilerplates, of different types of agents that can carry out different kinds of activities. So agents that represent individual assets, agents that represent supervisors or uh, dust control, agents that, that um, monitor the service levels and form like service managers which, to determine what kind of hierarchy and how, how should, which agents should communicate with each other, which, how should the communication sh um, um, happen and so on. So different agents might have different responsibilities and these different types of agents can be easily deployed using these templates, these, these boilerplates as new services form or, or um, services drop off uh, in, in, the, in the network. And this, this slide really just that, that pulls all that those ideas together. Uh, say what, what this is saying is that at the bottom of the screen, we have the actual physical network. And sitting on top of that physical network is the collection of agents. Now, individual agents might be linked to individual assets. Or, uh, well, that is a question that we have um, um, yet to answer as well. Does each asset, each node in the network need to have a, an agent representing it? But not only agent rep representing individual assets, but as I said before, uh, different services might be provided by different collection of these nodes. And so there has to be a service manager agent or a controller agent that manages that service provision that actually talks to the agents of the assets that are involved in providing that, that service. So there is some level of hierarchy that you can see here um, um, appearing in this, in this architecture. But what I've seen, what you've seen is that this it doesn't necessarily mean that this agent um, 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 agents agent deployment need to be hierarchical. There are various ways in which we can actually deploy these agents. And what we've seen is that the way in which we deploy these agents and the control structure is is implemented has an implication on uh, not only the cost of deploying these these assets these these agents but also in the resource um, uh, utilization as well. So at, at the moment, we are exploring four different architectures, centralized architecture, where it's, it's really uh, everything is based on a central controller, um, hierarchical archi architecture, where there's, there's, a, there's a local supervisor that is, that is talking to a collection of assets, uh, which is again um, at a higher level managed by a global supervisor, which, which has overall view of what the BT network does and so on. And the third is heterarchical architecture, where there is a higher level supervisor, but most of the communication and control is actually handed over to the, the local agents themselves, perhaps one of the agents taking on the responsibility of a leader of of a group of uh, agents to the other extreme is completely distributed architecture where there is no supervisors involved and the agents self-organize to, to deliver um, the service that is that is required. And these, these, these architectures have got different um, memory requirements, different processing um, uh, requirements, and also cost implications as well. So although I put up the graphs uh, for our analysis, initial analysis there, I don't want to discuss too deeply into this because this is still early stages. We need to do a lot more analysis to really come up with any concrete picture. But the, the, the key message here is that the architectural option is not clear and it needs to be carefully thought through. So that's it. I come up to the end, end of this talk. Um, a few concluding remarks is that, that that holistic strategic approach is really key to, to maximizing value from the, the network. And what we have seen is that data and digitalization has that, that potential to really radically improve the way in which we manage the network. And it's not just about machine learning. It's not just about data analysis. It's, it's really piggybacking on that word intelligence and saying, okay, how can we make our assets really intelligent and allow them to communicate, allow them to make decisions, allow them to collab collaborate and co cooperate with each other. However, a lot of challenges still remain, and that's why that's what um, our focus is on uh, in the NGCDI project. So thank you. I'll, I'll stop there.